Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to our participants and audience here physically in the Royal Society and also to our online participants. Thank you for joining us as well for today's event on the new the UK's fusion program, uh, which we're holding at a sort of topical moment because the, the Euratom program at Cullum and the uh, main uh, joint European Taurus facility there has just come to the end of its life. Uh, but we've also had a significant new statement of new fusion strategy from the government announced towards the end of last year with a new impetus behind it. And let me get out of the way now the old cliche that fusion is always 30 years ahead of us. I'm saying it now so that nobody else needs to say it because it's not true any longer. Things are speeding up. We are uh, we're, and we can sense that from the activity going on in the UK. Well, I hope we're going to learn much more about that uh, this evening. Um, we're going to hear for, and we are going to hear first, actually, from the senior official uh, in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, John Staples, who is responsible for the policy framework. And it seemed logical that we should first hear from him, and then we'll hear from Ian Chapman and our other speakers. Uh, if you are joining online, do, of course, use the uh, Q&A function, not the chat function, and start putting your questions in as soon as you like and upvoting the questions that you think are particularly topical, because we will, of course, then have a Q&A session with a mixture of questions here from the physical audience and you guys online. So now, without any more ado, over to John Staples from the department. Thank you. I, I was starting this talk in this august institution by asking how to move the slides on, which is a very technical scientific question. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's, it's an incredibly exciting topic to talk about um, and, and a great panel. So I wanted to talk through really the kind of overarching policy framework that shapes our approach on fusion and to provide some context for the, uh, for the other speakers who are coming. So fusion is really difficult, right? It's incredibly hard. So why do it? Why are we so interested in it? Well, because the prize is potentially enormous. Um, so the case for, for pursuing fusion is very strong. We know global energy demand is rising. There are various different projections. I think the IEA say it will rise by 75% over the next 30 years or so. We know there's a global need for energy security and decarbonization. Um, and a massive technological challenge to deliver that. And fusion could play a crucial role in doing this. Five qualities that fusion has uh, support that. So potentially abundant resources. Um, sorry, there's a slight echo. It's me. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, so you know the key ingredients in fusion: uh, deuterium, which is found in seawater; tritium, which can be bred within the facility. Uh, so you have a fuel cycle built in. Um, it's carbon free. It provides a base load firm power so it can counter the intermittency of renewables. It's incredibly energy dense um, and it has much shorter lived waste, uh, far fewer waste issues than, than fission. Um, there is no waste, uh, radioactive waste byproduct. Some of the components can become radioactive in the process, but as a, as a challenge, as a policy and technical challenge, the waste issue is far lesser, far lesser than it is in uh, fission. The UK has fantastic record in fusion, one we should be very proud of. So we've been working on fusion R&D since the middle of the 20th century. We have an exceptionally strong institutional setup. Um, we hosted a Japanese delegation who came over a few months ago, and they were very struck by the, the strength of UK institutions. Ian runs the biggest fusion organization in the world at the UK Energy Authority. The Cullum campus is uh, tends to be the first stop uh, for our new ministers when they arrive at the department because it is close to London, and it has a fantastic set of facilities out there. So I've listed three there, which Ian will talk about in more detail, including the Joint European Tourist Facility, which Lord Willis mentioned, uh, which has had a, a glorious career that came to an end a couple of months ago, but signed off in great fashion by breaking its own world record for power output from fusion. And we have a growing private sector. So we have increasingly, we have very impressive emerging companies like Tokamak Energy, First Light Fusion, coming out of the UK. So exceptionally strong foundations to build on. 
In the autumn, we published an updated fusion strategy, really with two key objectives. So the first one, and this is really significant, um, because this is not just a science project. This is about industrial strategy and building a sector, building jobs and supporting growth. So the first approach is building a world leading fusion industry, supporting different technologies, one capable of exports, capable of establishing world leading companies in the UK. And the second and a key kind of anchor part of the strategy is developing a prototype fusion power plant to deliver net energy. And, and again, to prove commercial viability. So ultimately this is about demonstrating commercial viability, getting to a world where we have a proper private sector infusion. Um, and, and again, from a UK perspective, there are fantastic scientific gains to be made from this, but there's also a big economic opportunity here if we play it right. Uh, so a few elements of the strategy. The first is step, so this is the spherical tokamak for energy production. So this is our prototype fusion plant project. Again, Ian will talk about this in more detail, but it's going quite well. So we committed 240 million pounds to it up to 2025. We have acquired a site. Uh, the site is at West Burton. It is in the location of a old coal plant. So a great story in terms of taking an area that has a long energy history, long energy heritage, um, that is fading, but has a great opportunity to, to revive using, using fusion. We're setting up a delivery organization, UK Industrial Fusion Solutions, and we're very shortly going to start procurement for private sector partners. So this will end up being a public-private collaboration. Ian will talk about that in a bit more detail. Uh, fusion Futures, Lord Willits mentioned, this is um, a new commitment uh, that we announced in the autumn, 650 million pounds for the UK fusion industry. Again, really, um, we are spreading this in several ways. So it's partly about facilities, it's partly about skills, it's partly about R&D, again, with the aim of growing the sector overall. Um, and we've got some highlights here. So uh, 200 million pounds for a new facility focused on tritium breeding, tritium handling. It's one of the key scientific engineering challenges remaining in fusion. 56 million pounds for a skills program. You know, part of growing this sector is upskilling. And, and in that, we're not just thinking about PhDs. UK AEA run an extremely successful apprenticeship program at the moment. We want to develop that, um, take that further, grow that, and then focus on skills across the spectrum. Regulation and planning. So um, I was in Washington last week uh, at various fusion conferences and talking to the US. And regulation came up again and again as a really key enabler for the growth that we want to see in this sector. Um, and the UK is uh, ahead of the game, he says modestly. Um, we passed legislation in, in the autumn, um, which is quite important because it, it basically established that fusion will be regulated differently from fission, reflecting its different risk profile. So instead of going through the Office for Nuclear Regulation, fusion projects will go through the Environment Agency and HSC. HSE, we think that's a really significant thing. And we've had very positive feedback from the industry on what that means for them. The next phase for us in terms of the, this, this kind of policy framework is we'll be consulting on a national policy statement. So like other key infrastructure se sectors, this will ensure fusions given consideration and proper, um, proper priority within the planning system. Um, and the final, final key limb of the strategy is around international collaboration. So Fusion's an international endeavor. This is a massive, massive mission. Um, there's two aspects of this for us. So first is deepening our bilateral relationships. So we have entered into a strategic partnership with the US. We had the first meeting of our coordinating committee in Washington last Thursday. Kate was there. It went quite well. We have industry and academic representatives on that as well. And we think there's loads of areas where we can work very closely with the US. Skills, facilities, R&D being three. Uh, we've also entered into a, a relationship with Canada on similar grounds, um, and we are in close touch with Germany, with Japan, with Korea. So lots of opportunities for developing bilateral relationships. And then multilateral relationships, work, this is a, a, a big priority over the next few years, is working through the IAEA as the industry grows to ensure that um, the approach set at a multilateral level is enabling rather than hindering growth. Um, areas like regulation and export control are areas where we can really advance things through those uh, fora. To conclude, um, the UK has quite a <coughs> precious thing here in that this is potentially a transformative technology of enormous economic value, and we have great strengths in it. Uh, we have, in many ways, a strategic advantage over many other countries in fusion. So it's very important that we maintain that and hold on to it and grow it. And that's really what the strategy is geared at. It's about 
taking us forward into the next stage, growing this into a proper industry as the technology commercializes. Stop there. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, next, we'll hear from Professor Sir Ian Chapman, who was appointed head of Tokamak Science at Cullum in 2014 and became the chief executive officer of UKAA in 2016. Ian, over to you. So I will build on what John has said. Um, David introduced this meeting by saying there's a lot going on in fusion. Um, and fusion is not necessarily always manana, manana, forever away. Um, and there is also a lot of change going on in fusion. So I thought I'd just pick up on what some of that change is. So in the top right hand side here, you see, oh, left, left hand side. Um, it's the same, isn't it, on both ways? Um, you see uh, NIF. So this is uh, the National Ignition Facility in the US, who um, in 2022 announced that they had achieved real fusion power with a, a net thermal gain. So you get more thermal power out than put in. Um, and that's a huge step for fusion, a really, really big step. Um, in the middle, you see JET, a joint European tourist that we host here in the UK, the largest fusion facility in the world, um, where we have successively broken our own world record a number of times over the last three years, um, setting a final world record at 69 megajoules over about five seconds. Now, that's sort of 10 or 11 megawatts for five seconds doesn't sound hugely impressive. Um, but the really important part of those experiments were that they overlaid exactly what we predicted would happen. Um, and that means we have confidence in our predictions as we now move ahead to big experiments, like the one that you see at the bottom of the picture here, which is ITER. Um, for those of you that don't know, ITER is the largest scientific collaboration ever undertaken by humanity. It's a huge project in every sense. Um, both footprint, price, uh, time scale, um, geopolitical complexity, and in my view, impact. Um, if ITER works and produces a very significant net power gain where we'll put 50 megawatts of thermal power in and produce 500 megawatts of fusion power outwards, um, that really demonstrates that you can do fusion on commercial scale. And ITER is now largely built, right? so most of the components of, of ITER have been built, and many of those components are um, you know, ridiculously complicated. Um, at the start of the project, we didn't have supply chains for them, we didn't really think they could be built, and they now exist. Um, so, so many first of a kind, so many world firsts involved in that project, which has led to, a, frankly, a whole new industry. Um, and, and we're delighted to see big energy companies, big engineering firms have been implicitly involved in ITER the whole way through. Um, Whilst it is a big global project, uh, UK companies have been heavily involved in that. 650 million's worth of contracts have come into the UK supply chain. Um, a UK company leads the construction management as agent. A UK company led the architect engineer. So those are the core contracts for actually the assembly and the build of ITER. So um, it has been a complete change in the fusion landscape. We are now doing things at power plant scale and we are beginning to have industrial comp competence to do that. But we are no longer in ITER. We are not in the Euratom Research and Training Program. Um, and JET, in the middle, ceased operation at the end of last year. So a, cha a time of much change. However, as John said, we are very lucky that the UK genuinely has a, a unique competence in fusion that you cannot find anywhere else. Um, uh, as John said, that's multifaceted. So it goes from our national lab, UKAA, which is the largest fusion organization in the world at the moment, and, and I often say that, um, you know, I will feel that we have succeeded when we are no longer the largest fusion organization in the world, but actually that is in the private sector. Um, we have that, a lot of that competence is born from JET, so at the top here, but we are also um, the first people to build a spherical tokamak, and we think spherical tokamaks offer huge potential for minimizing cost and, um, and therefore maximizing commercial viability of fusion power plants. The first ever in the UK, the best in the world currently in the UK. Um, we have also developed competence in all the enabling technologies that you need for fusion. So be that the materials which have to withstand a pretty un, um, un, unfavoring environment with uh, the most intense neutron source on the planet um, and huge heat gradients to deal with, um, how you manufacture and test and qualify those materials, how you maintain the inside of the machine, which is, again, a place you can't send people, so you have to do robotically, um, how you fuel the facility, which means that we have to make our own tritium. 
Um, tritium very short half life. There's no natural tritium left. You have to make it. So understanding how you store, process, and fuel the machine with tritium is key. Um, and you need to stitch all of that together with some pretty complex um, computing, uh, advanced computing. And we do all of those things in the UK. And that enables us to do the things at the bottom. So we have really stimulated our supply base. We have um, invested heavily in skills and will continue to do so with the government support. We're thinking very hard about technology transfer, into fusion from other adjacent industries and also out of fusion, um, and many examples of that over the last few years. And we're stimulating um, the competence to build power plants. And that's multifaceted. So it goes from having a national endeavor to build a prototype power plant, behind which will come, we hope, very large engineering and energy firms. And you'll hear from Francesca later, who represents one of those. Um, at the same time as investing in industry programs which stimulate SMEs and stimulate new technology and stimulate innovation in the sector. Um, and, and John pointed to Tokamak Energy and First Light Fusion, but there are a number of other startup companies as well in fusion and adjacent technologies being born in the UK, which is really good to see. Um, I'll skip that because you already talked about it. This is genuinely a national endeavor. We see now fusion is not just Cullum. It is really all over the country. Um, UKAA, as the National Lab now, has four sites. Um, we have university partners in 35 different universities. Um, and we set up a, a fusion cluster of like-minded industry partners um, two years ago. We expected we might have a dozen, maybe two dozen, if we were lucky. We had 205 without really trying. Um, so there are lots and lots of partners now working in fusion. We have actually 4,000 companies contracted and working in fusion at the moment, which is... Um, you know, it's certainly more than an order of magnitude from a few years ago. I mentioned the spherical tokamak and the potential that it has. Um, let me show you just one little bit of science, because I think it's important to show some science. Um, one of the, the big hindrances to the spherical tokamak, what we're trying to do is make the power plant as compact as possible. If you look at ITER, so the big, big um, international experiment I talked about, about a third of the money goes in very large buildings. And about a third of the money goes on some very large magnets with the largest cryogenics plant in the world to cool those magnets. And that's where all the money really goes. So if you can use smaller magnets because you design the magnetic geometry more efficiently and therefore put them in a much smaller building, you can strip out billions of cost. I mean, really billions of overnight cost. This was the premise that the UK, I mean, much smarter people than me came up with this idea way back in the 80s. We built the first one of these ever in the 90s. We showed it was far more efficient than alternative ways of approaching fusion. But the boundary condition for fusion is that it has to, your fuel has to be 100 million degrees or it doesn't fuse. If you now take that sort of heat source and put it into a much smaller volume, the chances of melting the walls of your box are obviously a lot higher. So um, the rest of the world never really invested in spherical tokamaks. As I said, this is probably a dead end. You'll never be able to cope with the heat. Um, and we said, we agree. If we don't find a solution for how to extract the heat, then this is a dead end. So we need to find a way of extracting the heat. So we built this machine called Mast Upgrade. Um, I was you know, deeply proud that this was the winner of the Royal Academy of Engineering's Major Projects Prize a couple of years ago. The first time, by the way, ever a public project had won that. Um, and this was what we were attempting to do. So the red line here is the conventional way of extracting heat from any fusion power plant, uh, any magnetically confined fusion power plant, where you see a lot of heat, so a very high heat density in the narrow area. Um, we said, we think we can do it like the blue line here. So reduce the peak heat flux, which gets to the wall by a factor of 10. And actually in any industry that you work in, if you're 10 times better than your competitor, you have a major, major market advantage. So that's what we said we would do. We published that in open literature uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and I must admit, I don't think everybody in the community thought we would achieve that, me included at times. Um, and then we turned on our facility in 2021 and these were our first results. And if you wanna see experiment match modeling, you could do worse, right? So um, this tells me two things, it works, it really does work. And two, our models are at least reasonably representative of what happens in the real world. And that gave us confidence to move ahead, as, as John described, with the spherical tokamak for energy production. So a prototype power plant program aiming to produce net energy and to minimize the capital costs. Frankly, the UK is just not big enough in the energy market to do volume. We will never have a product which becomes cheapest by doing volume. We have to have a product which is innovative and therefore becomes cheaper than our competitors by being cleverer. 
Uh, that is always going to be our value proposition. And that's what we think the Spherical Tokamak offers. Um, so our high-level program on this, we have now been about five years in concept design phase, and that's really a pre-concept design phase, where we've said we would mature the, the design. We'd establish a regulatory framework. As John said, we passed legislation for that last year, so that's done. We choose a site, and I'll talk about that in a second, and we would set up a company to operate this. We are a national lab. We don't build infrastructure, so we need to work with partners to do that. Then we go into the detailed engineering design phase. We start some of the long lead procurement. We start the site development. The main construction happens over the 2030s, and we are aiming to complete, um, complete the build by 2040. So this is both simultaneously um, a depressingly long time scale and also a hugely audacious time scale. It's both of those things at the same time. Um, the site that we chose after um, a two-year process with 15 nominations, which really went top to bottom, east to west, we down-selected to five on the short list and then chose this site. As John said, it, um, until March last year, was a coal power station operated by EDF. Um, but this is the tagline of the proponents, so I can't claim it's my own, but this is a story of fossils to fusion, which is a great tagline. Um, and there's lots to like about the site. So it has a train line. It has a direct connection to our national grid, no new pylons, no new substations. It has a two gigawatt abstraction license of water from the Trent. Uh, it has uh, millions of people living in the local environs at less than an hour away. And it has a population who their whole lives have been involved in power generation. Um, three miles down the river is another gigawatt power station. Three miles down the river is another gigawatt power station. So that whole uh, area has been driven by power generation and they want new power projects. This is, by the way, the only in the whole world, the only fusion power plant pro project that actually has a site and is actually getting on with preparing that site. And I thought I'd show you a little video because who doesn't like seeing things being blown up by dynamite? Um, so this is that coal power station. Um, as I say, we're, we're about a year through um, now and it's coming down. We're just getting on with developing the site and actually preparing the, the, the way that we can get on with building a fusion power plant and benefit from all the power infrastructure that is already there. So that is actually, we're just quietly in our British way going about getting on with things. There's no sound on that video, it's quiet. Um, we also are setting up um, a public-private partnership in a slightly different way to many other countries in the world where um, many other countries in the world are stimulating um, SMEs by investing in them and, and working together with the state, but are not working on power plant programs we're doing both. So we have an industry program which is about stimulating innovation and working with SMEs, but we also have a national endeavor which is about building a power plant. Um, the first thing that we will do once we've set up this new company, UK Industrial Fusion Solutions, which actually begins trading next week, 1st of April, um, is to contract two partners. So an engineering partner and a construction partner who will be with us on that 20 year journey to build a prototype. And our aspiration is that having done that, they then have the competence not just having built a prototype, but they then go and build three power stations, and then they go and build 10 power stations, and then they can go and build 50 power stations. And this is huge export potential for the UK, not just having a design of a power plant, but enabling the whole supply chain in the critical technologies which are required for fusion. Uh, you go back to my first slide, in tritium, in materials, in robotics, in manufacturing. Um, and then the last ingredient is people. Um, as, as John said, we're working very hard on training the next generation of people. The government have invested heavily in apprentice training centres. We opened this in 2019. So what was that? Five years ago, we had 10 learners. Today, we have 460. We're training learners for 35 different organisations, and we will be doing 1,000 a year in three years' time. So that is already committed by the government. Um, that's great, and we want to do the same at not just apprentice level, but at graduate level, at PhD level, at postdoc level. And there is a 55 million pound investment from the government to do that. Um, so you're really seeing a proper coherent plan here, a national strategy backed by a power plant program, which is crowding in big energy companies. At the same time, investment in the SMEs and innovation program, investment in research, which keeps us at the cutting edge, investment in skills, um, investment in the campus and clustering and bringing together everybody at one site. It's a really coherent, um, holistic strategy for which our government is famed. <laughs> Sorry, you turn, you turn that into a joke. I, I was being genuine. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude there. Some really big advances in the last um, couple of years, broken the world record many times, setting up 
new facilities across all of the enabling technology that you need for fusion, clustering people together with strong campus growth, and we're seeing proper inward investment into this country on the hundreds of millions scale. Um, Step is progressing perfectly on track. All the things we said we'd do in the first phase, I'm delighted to say we have done, which is very good. And we are seeing proper collaboration with industry on the scale of thousands of companies now involved in fusion that just was not the case five years ago. And we hope that continues to increase notably as we now procure partners to move forward with the STEP program with us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. Ian, and congratulations on delivering your lines with a straight face. That went down fantastically. We're now going to hear from Dr. Kate Lancaster. She is based at the York Plasma Institute, part of the School of Physics, Engineering and Technology, uh, having moved to York, having studied earlier at Imperial. Kate, over to you. Okay, so uh, I am going to bring it back to some science because that is my want. So um, I want to start off by presenting the three knobs we can twiddle to, to get fusion to work, right? Just so that we can see how inertial fusion fits into this picture, right? So temperature, as Ian said, is a non-negotiable, right? It needs to be hot. And so really what you have are, are two other knobs that you can twiddle, right? So the density of your particles in the system and the time in which you can confine those together where you're producing net energy, right? Because if you don't do that, then it's game over, right? So you can imagine you can have a system that has a moderate density of particles, which you can keep together for a long period of time, or have a very dense system of particles, which you keep together for a short period of time, but do that over and over again. So it just so happens that the two sort of main approaches to, to fusion kind of fall into those categories. Um, You've heard a lot about uh, magnetically confined plasmas, which generally are a moderate density of particles kept together for a long time, right? Um, well, on the other side of things, you can have a system where you can compress some fuel to very high density uh, until it kind of self-ignites. So almost like a diesel engine, but for, for nuclear fusion. And then you do that at 10 hertz, right? And that is what we call uh, inertial confinement fusion, where you're actually, there's no active confinement there, right? You're just confining the fuel by its own inertia and it will disassemble and that is when it is game over, right? So what does that look like? Well, you can do this with photons, right? Doesn't matter if it's lasers in the optical or whether it's x-rays from the whole realm. You irradiate your little pellet, which is a ball bearing size pellet of deuterium and tritium. You heat up the outer layer uh, and that expands very violently in a process called ablation. If any of you have had your eyes lasered, that's what happens to your cornea, obviously not uh, to this extent. And of course, if you've got something ablating outwards very violently uh, by Newton's third law, the rest has to collapse inwards, right? The materials compressed to about a thousand times solid density. Uh, and eventually this, hot, this piston action will cause the, the temperature uh, in the center to rise very high. You get uh, what we call a hot spot uh, and fusion occurs, alpha particles are produced there and then you get the next bit heating up and more alpha particles are produced and so forth. So you get a kind of fusion burn wave propagating through the fall. All right, this happens very quickly, you know, a fraction of a second. Okay, so you have to do that multiple times a second for a power station. So, so that's what ICF is. And just to say there are two sorts of different flavors of inertial confinement fusion, one of which is you take a little gold can called a whole ram. This is a German word meaning cavity or empty space. Uh, the lasers fire into the can, it heats the can up, hot things radiate, right? And it just so happens that this can is so hot that the radiation is kind of in the soft X-ray. And those X-rays bathe your little capsule uh, and do the compression. Now, I'm a big fan of uh, the keep it simple, stupid principle. And so you could just do away with all that and then just fire the lasers directly onto the capsule and compress it using optical photons, right? Either way, the result is the same. You compress fuel to high density and get uh, ignition, right? Well, hopefully, right? That's the aim. So just to tell you a little bit about the current scientific landscape, the, the, the focus is not here. I will say that now, right? Massive 
a unique facility uh, built at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the Bay Area of California called the National Ignition Facility. Clues in the name, it was designed to get ignition. Let me just tell you what we mean by ignition here. Ignition is defined as the energy obtained due to fusion, right? Is it basically exceeds the laser energy that you couple in, right? It's not wall plug efficiency. These lasers are horrifically inefficient, 1% or less. So if you exceed the laser energy, that's great, but it's not net energy, right? So I just want to make that very, very clear what that definition is, all right? So that is what they have defined as ignition. And uh, it's based on the indirect drive approach. So this firing into a gold can and then heating the fuel, and that's partly for uh, issues of national security and stockpile stewardship uh, weapons physics. Otherwise, this facility uh, wouldn't have been built, essentially. Um, it's the, the largest laser system in the world. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, the most beautiful laser system in the world. It's in incredible. They've fielded over 50 different diagnostics. And anyone who's ever done any kind of experiments knows that getting 50 instruments to work simultaneously is just, well, a miracle, frankly. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm always aware of the conservation of bad misprincible where if you've got a set of diagnostics working on your experiment and you want to bring another one on, one of your other diagnostics has to fail or somewhere somewhere over uh, on another part of site, someone is having a bad time because there's only a finite amount of scientific success in the world, right? So, um, so basically they did not get ignition to begin with. There were lots of problems in terms of um, their predictive capability and so forth, but after an incredibly beautiful, careful set of experimental and theoretical work, they managed to achieve ignition, which frankly I'm incredibly excited about because I started this game in 2001 and, and in advanced inertial fusion schemes. So to me, this is what I've been waiting for my whole career, frankly, so it's very exciting. Uh, they achieved this for the first time on the 5th of December, 2022. Uh, they put two, two and a bit megajoules of uh, laser energy in and they get uh, three and a bit out, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, just to kind of put into context what a megajoule is, there's about a megajoule of energy in a four bar Kit Kat, right? So, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you've never eaten a four bar Kit Kat in 10 nanoseconds. I know we've all given it a good go, but that, that's what's the, the sheer power of this system, right? So um, demonstration of this is robust. It's not just a one-off. It's now been demonstrated many times. And I hear on the underground grapevine from people last week, that we're now at the sort of six megajoule level, which is very exciting. So, but you didn't hear it from me. Um, on the global stage, there are, I mean, let's be real, the NIF is the only show in town that's capable of getting ignition, but there are lots of supporting facilities around the world. And this is not a, an exhaustive picture of laser systems. There are lots of high rep rate, low energy systems, which we do our bread and butter on. But these are the ones that have been largely involved in, um, inertial fusion energy and I've included pulse power machines in here of course as well because you know first light fusion is based on pulse power right and that's uh, a, a different thing entirely other than um, lasers um, so you can see not so many systems around the world but it's a global endeavor and um, it's all mixed up people go and use different facilities and and um, but you know it uh, requires money to get access to these systems right so it's a it's a big endeavor so where do we sit in this picture? So we have a very well-established, decades-old community in, in this sort of, in the fusion space here, in inertial fusion. It's a relatively modest-sized community, six or seven universities and some national labs and AWE, all Marston, and now First Light Fusion involved in these spaces. Um, we've been world leaders for a long time in the science, uh, We've got high intensity lasers that we've led the world in with Vulcan and Gemini and Orion, world leading targetry capability, world leading in theory and computation um, in the high energy density space. So we we get a lot of bang for our buck for a, for a relatively small community. We definitely punch above our weight. Um, also, many scientists who were from the UK, lots of trained at Imperial College ended up at Lawrence Livermore and have been deeply involved in the NIF uh, program um, with um, 
uh, the, the, the ignition discovery, and also the UK as well, and universities in the UK were involved in, in, in the ignition program as well. So um, we've, we've got that expertise here as well, even if we don't have the big shiny laser, right? And we have a huge role to play in the future of IFE as well. Um, obviously, John's told you about this UK-US relationship, and we've had long-standing relationship with the US in this space. Um, and it would be nice to have a bit more of a joined up approach in, in that respect, uh, I think. So one of the things that our relatively modest community has done to try and give ourselves a bigger collective voice, because really what we are is just a bunch of mavericks, right? And herding academics is like herding cats to a certain extent. So this is always gonna be a bit of a challenge, um, but we've managed to form um, uh, what we call the UK Inertial Fusion Consortium. It consists of about 90 members from the CLF, which is our sort of where we nucleate around, which is the lasers that are based at the Rutherford Atherton Laboratory. Indeed, I spent 10 and a half years working there before going to York, um, Imperial College, University of Warwick, University of Oxford, AWE Aldermaston, University of York, Strathclyde, Queen's University of Belfast, University of Lancaster, and of course, First Light Fusion, which is uh, this company uh, we now have in the UK based on inertial fusion, but not laser driven. Um, it was established to try and foster a much more joined up approach to what we do, um, to foster collaboration, coordination, and try and get a bit more of a collective voice for our community in the UK. Um, we've created a UK fusion, uh, IFE fusion roadmap, looking at the period from 2021 when it was created to 2035. We do need to zhuzh it up a bit, needs a little bit of updating if you do happen to go and have a look at it, but certainly because <laughs> it was created before the demonstration of ignition, right? So things, things have changed a little bit and we ought to make hay while the sun is shining very brightly upon us. Um, also inertial fusion is considered to be part of the fusion, fusion futures envelope. And so there are funds to support some of the activity, you know, for example, buying shots on Omega and things like that. So the chair of this committee is currently Robbie Scott. He's based at STFC uh, Central Laser Facility. Um, and so if you're interested in this, that's his contact details, okay? And just to finally talk a little bit about the diffusion roadmap, because obviously, you know, the, the center of mass is not here, it's in the US when ignition has been demonstrated. So how can we possibly as a modest community compete with that? Well, we still have like very world leading stuff here and where we think we can make uh, a really big impact is on what comes next. Right, because the way NIF is set up, you're not going to get high gain. And what do I mean? How much energy you get out for what you put in, right? Um, and so we have always been working on what comes next, the advanced inertial confinement fusion schemes that will get us to gains of 100 or more, right? Um, I feel slightly vindicated because my PhD was on an advanced scheme and uh, we were considered mavericks at the time. So uh, we're coming home to roost now, which is kind of exciting. Um, so there's that, but then there's also the actual nitty gritty science of ignition as well, where we've always had expertise in the high energy density landscape. Um, the roadmap focuses on a number of different areas. So certainly the, the hardcore research side of things, which is clearly where we do have expertise. Um, funding, thinking about how to increase the funding going into the IFE landscape and for what. Um, facilities and technology. So both in terms of we've got some of the, the best lasers in the world here and um, some of the best technology as well in terms of enabling technologies and particularly things like uh, digital as well, right? In terms of our computational uh, program that we have here. And they're also looking at the UK strategy at large. What, what do we do? How do we move forward um, in this kind of endeavor now that we know that ignition has been demonstrated, which does frankly make life a bit easier for ourselves. Um, and not only that, this is, we're looking through the lenses as well of how do we grow the community? How do we grow it equitably, right? Every, every decision must be made with a view to making our commu community more diverse and more equitable. And also how do we train people? So we're very joined up. Uh, we obviously have a deep relationship with uh, UK AEA anyway. I say we, York does, but um, so it's really important to be joined up in the training of, of, of people who are entering the fusion space. And there's loads of overlap between the IFE community and the MCF community. So I'm gonna finish on that note, but if um, you are interested in this, uh, this um, 
consortium there is information here and also just I've, there's some resources here so whoever gets these slides um there's just a whole bunch of stuff around um the NIF ignition the papers are out now um we ran a, a high gain uh jamboree here a couple of years ago um at the royal society and there's your uh, initial fusion uh, consortium as well so on that note thank you so much for listening and i hope that's given you a little bit of flavor of icf in the uk thank you uh, very much for, for bringing the the laser model into the debate which is very important to hear as well um now our final speaker who i hope will be joining us online is francesca Maratza, who is head of the Magnetic Fusion Initiatives Unit at uh, ENI, Italy's energy company. Uh, there is a, I'm just going to pause with, to see if we have successfully established connection, which may or not be, may or may not be easier than nuclear fusion. Uh, let's see if it's happening. Um, the hello, can, oh, can you? Wonderful. Fantastic, <laughs> Francesca. It worked. So, so the next step is fusion, isn't it? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, I'm going to thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand over to you. We're looking forward to your uh, contribution. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me and. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, uh, but it just didn't work out. So um, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, Eni is an energy company. We're based in Italy, but we are a, a global company. We work in over 60 countries, including the UK. We've been in the UK since 1964, and we have about 1,000 people involved in engineering and projects. So um, it's um, it's an important country for us. And I will start with the question, why? Why fusion for us? As an energy company, we are involved in a, in, in a decarbonization path uh, uh, since a few years with a very aggressive, uh, aggressive schedule and targets to decarbonize completely by 2050, scope one, two, and three, so everything. This means we have a mix of energy sources. We have a, a renewable energy company, working on wind and solar, for instance, uh, including the UK with the Dogger Bank project on wind. And we have CCS in Liverpool Bay. Uh, so we have a, a, a presence in, in the UK, which uh, they, they spans on, on, on different, uh, in different projects and different technologies. But why fusion? We saw fusion coming a few years ago. We, we were observing the world of fusion, but never actually uh, invested in uh, until we saw the technology really maturing and the time right to get fusion in the decarbonization path. And this due to the technology advances, uh, including, of course, all, all the, uh, in, the enormous amount of work done at JET uh, and also, of course, at ITER, which was, was quoted before. Uh, and, uh, and we saw the the need for private investment in, uh, in, in fusion as an important uh, extra point to what had been largely a government-based uh, set, set of programs, international and so on, very important. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, that was what was mentioned as well, that uh, new technology could bring uh, more compact uh, power stations, uh, with uh, high field um, superconductors and and uh, and uh, smaller devices compared to what ITER is, and of course we like ITER. ITER has been a cornerstone in in the development of uh, and is still uh, in in the development of fusion. But the access for private companies to technology um, is a relatively new thing. Um, so we we started investing in in fusion in a company, a startup. Um, a spin-off from, from the MIT, Commonwealth Fusion Systems in, in the US, but we didn't stop there. Uh, we are an energy company, but we are a strongly technology-based company, and uh, we, we, we like to master technology and be able to, to guide the, the path to, to, to the use of technology. So we see a mix. Uh, renewables are already there for biofuels done 
fusion still to do, but in in uh, in view. And we really thought we we thought that the fusion is coming and it's coming sooner than expected, sooner than what the traditional roadmaps were uh, were foreseeing. Uh, I won't say the joke because it has already been said. Um, but we see we see fusion being a reality much sooner than uh, than uh, anticipated by existing roadmaps. Um, th this means that we have also engaged in uh, how so how are we doing this with with our own um, with our own engineers and and uh, and the research people and uh, and and not a lot of other uh, involvement in, in terms of HSE and um, public affairs uh, because you need you need a, a lot to grow a sector. Uh, being an energy company it means that we need we want to use the energy so we want to be uh, dealing with the with the power stations and delivering energy to the to the grid uh, and also making sure that uh, this is done in a proper way we are used to big complex uh, difficult projects in difficult parts of the world and uh, so we we thought this is the challenge we want it, it gives a lot of power it gives firm power it gives base load and it it it, uh, it uh, complements renewables, for instance, and the transition can be done, of course, using uh, lower carbon intensive uh, fossil fuels, which we're already doing. But fusion, of course, is a challenge. We know there are a lot of uh, unknown things, uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, so uh, engaging with the best in class. Uh, to um, deliver the, the the results we need, uh, especially going to the fuel cycle, for instance, which has never been tested on an industrial level, and going to commercial uh, power stations and power plants is a is a big challenge. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, engaged with a with a very shorter, much shorter timeline compared to the existing ones. And we know that this has created a bit of, of um, uh, well, at least debate in, in, the, in the existing scientific community. Uh, we're not going to say this year compared to the other year, but it's certainly, uh, fusion is certainly uh, coming true much uh, faster than, uh, than expected. And so why UK in this, in all this? Uh, I said we invested in, uh, in in a company in the US. We also have a, a, a venture with Enea in Italy for DTT, which is an experimental facility, giving a lot of engineering solutions. Uh, but UK for us is a, a um, an example of uh, uh, of of course managing jet, which uh, has been so successful over the years. Um, and a lot of other knowledge, including the fuel, including tritium cycle, including materials, and all the things that need to be done in, to make uh, a technology uh, actually a commercial, um, a commercial reality. And you need everything to do that. And you need the, su the supply chain. Uh, we are a bit of a different actor because we are an energy company, so we are the, at the end of the of the supply chain. Uh, but we need we need uh, what we really think is that we need the the collaboration of all these entities together. And I think the UK is posing a very sound and important program to do so for UK, but for the the, the fusion space uh, at large. Uh, so uh, we we uh, we are really uh, very interested in in the practicality and the pragmatism that uh, UK have. Have uh, are bringing uh, bringing about, uh, and also, uh, in order to grow an industry on such a difficult technology, you need a stable, predictable environment. You need uh, you need a regulatory system which is uh, clear, which is different from fission, and the UK has done all this, and this is very very valuable. Uh, in Italy, uh, we have just started a a, a national program. Uh, to define what sort of uh, nuclear energy, sustainable nuclear energy, can come into the energy mix in Italy, and we have, we are in, we are part of this, of course, and we are bringing the case of UK as a virtuous case of how you need to put every everything together, private, the public, and the regulatory system, 
uh, in order to, to uh, make it possible for commercial systems to, to develop because you need, uh, of course, you need a lot of investment for, for fusion to, to become a reality. Uh, uh, and a, a, we, we also got uh, quite a good response from, from Italian government uh, systems and, uh, and uh, regulators. Uh, so we also spoke to, uh, are speaking to the, to the UK government in order to bring together this experience and the US experience as well, um, in order not to reinvent the wheel, if you know what I mean. It, it's, it, it's really very important to get over uh, certain regulation constraints. Uh, so the other, the other important thing is, of course, uh, there's going to be a lot of investment needed to get fusion to be a reality, a commercial reality. And there again, UK is making a big effort with STEP, uh, which, uh, which we think is a, a very valuable contribution to fusion uh, development. Uh, but also the the role of UKAA, uh, with all that Ian has said about developing all the uh, the skills and having all the skills inside with materials, robotics, uh, maintenance, and and also uh, the repurposing of Jet because Jet has finished its first life but will enter a second life and that's going to be very valuable to the community to understand. Um, how to disassemble, what to do, how to do the, the tritium inventory and, and, and so on. So cooperation between different parts of the, of the community, public, private, uh, and the supply chain to be developed. Of course, ITER has been fundamental in this, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, enough. Uh, we need to sustain uh, contributing contributors from from SMEs and and uh, and the technology providers, and we also need to get more energy companies in the field in order to be the end users and the developers of of uh, of, of the systems that actually can provide uh, energy for for the people. Uh, and and of course, economy is 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 important as well. So uh, the combination of cooperation, regulatory system. Supply chain uh, and uh, uh, and overcoming that we know uh, a, a, a number of uh, existing challenges which still have to be addressed needs a combined effort. Um, we think that the UK is very well positioned in this, uh, and also uh, with an international cooperation. Of course, Euratom is not in in the radar anymore. Um, I'm not going to, to, to say this, to comment on this, but of course it has been a, a very good cooperation until now to, to build uh, upon existing skills and new skills. And of course you need people uh, because um, a growing industry, uh, I mean, when we started uh, getting involved in fusion, that was six years ago, there were just a few private companies and of course, a lot of uh, academic research and uh, national labs and so on. And now there are more than 40, uh, 40 startups. Uh, and uh, the need for people is very important. So the training program that UK has uh, at Callum is really, really key. And there will there, there's a need for more. And uh, for, for us, the UK is an example uh, to follow. And we also have, I can tell you, a framework agreement with the UK for research projects and development projects, which is uh, progressing uh, with Master U, with with uh, with the um, with the part of uh, 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 what you call uh, uh, control of the of the system uh, and many other projects and the fuel cycle. We're looking into that very very closely. So my message here is that uh, for us. Of course, we are not UK. We are UK based. We 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 have companies there, but we UK is an example, and we are bringing that example to the right tables in Europe and in Italy, and in US. Uh, so, um, well, that, that's uh, that's uh, I think that's going to progress very very steadily, uh, and uh, we are really looking forward to a lot more work together. Thank you. Very good. Well, can I invite all of our speakers up onto the platform? Um, 
Good. Well, those were four fascinating uh, presentations. And just to set the ball rolling, I think it's what we've heard is both an you know, excellent account of the strategy, but we've also had particularly from Kate, a reminder of some quite lively scientific issues. I'm a total lay person, but I do remember, even in my time, um, the ignition, the advocates of the ignition model and the charismatic Ed Moses, who um, was an advocate and still is, and as, as we've heard from Kate, and, and then the, the people who have probably the dominant view at Cullum going down a different route, the plasma model. And then in turn, there was another scientific dispute between the spherical model versus the super toroidal uh, model. And it was a fascinating example, because often I'm asked nowadays, well, um, is it an advantage or a disadvantage if you're a science minister who knows no science? And I say, and this is, I think, one of the most interesting examples. We had a meeting of the relevant EU Council of Ministers on problems we faced at ITER, which lost several hours because one of the European science ministers, who was a physicist, said the trouble is the model, the, the fusion model at ITER is the wrong model and we shouldn't be doing uh, we shouldn't be going down that approach. Instead, we should be doing the laser ignition approach. And there are points, even though I'm totally, and we are as lay people, in fact, I thought it was a warning of the dangers of having a physicist as a science minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always cited as a chapter, we found ourselves bogged down in this argument. However, um, there is a legitimate set of scientific disagreements. And everybody's been so courteous. I think we should just briefly surface them for a lay audience. And as you can see, what the, the strategy we ended up with then, and I you know, we might hear from John in a moment, but I'll start with it. The, the, the strategy had that with a sort of major and minor strategy, which we were doing the big approach through Cullum and uh, Itter, but also we did keep the, the laser option going as well. So, Ian, just tell, just tell us how that debate. Is, is now running from your perspective, then Kate might want to respond as well. Yeah, I, I think it's it's probably equally dangerous for science ministers that know no science to national lab directors that know no politics. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't think there's a debate really. I think um, you know all are valid and we should do all of them. And the, the as Francesca described, I think very eloquently, the, the goal at the end of this to have a low carbon sustainable energy solution is so massive and mm -hmm. the energy market is measured in trillions um, that it's worth trying different approaches. And, and nobody knows which will be either first or the most commercially viable long term. Um, and it could well be, and I actually think this is quite likely, that the, the first um, fusion power plant that produces electrons down a wire which lights a light will not be will not be representative of the thing that ultimately ends up with the dominant market position. So, um, you know, I absolutely think it's worth a diversity of approaches. Yeah. Um, in terms of the UK's position on that, so that the UK, obviously, we've operated JET, which is a conventional tokamak, but we have long since been proponents of finding a way of making that smaller. So we we invested in spherical tokamaks. And, and I would say that, you know, without trying to sound conceited, we probably are the world leaders in spherical tokamaks. Um, Conversely, there are other approaches to magnetic light for stellarators, for instance, yeah. where I think everybody would say Germany is the world leader in stellarators. And I think Kate was right in saying the US is the world leader in inertial confinement. So different states have a thing which they dominate in the field. Um, and and that, yeah. that's fine. And I think different approaches and valuing that diversity is a very valid thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, and especially for a medium-sized economy with a, with a limited budget, mm. you do face issues more, on yeah. prioritising. So what you describe, I'm sure, is, a, is good for the world, that globally yeah. there are yeah. different approaches. It can, one question is, it still is an issue for UK policy with a yeah. finite budget. I suppose one, one thing that I should say is that the, the underpinning technology of all of those approaches is largely common. So if you go with an inertial confinement, you still need a tritium plant. You still need to fuel the machine. You'll still need to maintain the machine. You'll still need materials that you can build the machine from, which are completely common with a spherical tokamak or a tokamak or a stellarator. They're all common. So the, the UK strategy 
by having a power plant design program is actually enabling the growth and the development of suppliers in those key technologies, which can supply to any variant of power plants. So, you know, J John's strategy had um, build a prototype power plant and then enable an industry which can sell globally. And by building a prototype, you enable an industry which can support all variants and all approaches to fusion. So you still get benefit to the country. Kate, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I agree with Ian. Sorry, that's really boring. This is so much friendlier than I remember the arguments. <laughs> made a lot of progress. You know, um, yeah, we're a smaller community and less coherent, uh, excuse the pun. Um, but one of the things that we do have a world lead in is the underpinning technology of high energy, high repetition rate lasers that you would need Yes, to build the, it. One of the constraints, isn't it? So that, this is where we need to be incredibly careful to do something now and act now and try and commercialize this now because we already sell these laser heads and related technology abroad. We're just about to kind of use this technology in our new laser system being built at the Red the Lab at EPAC. Um, we need to pay attention to do something about that now so that we maintain our world lead. So it might not necessarily be that we built the whole power plant, but that we we have capitalized on something that is a very key underpinning technology uh, moving forward. So so I, I don't see I don't see there being competition, actually, because there's room and space for that. I think that if you technology down select too soon, you shoot yourself in the foot, frankly, because it's too important to just put all your eggs in one basket. Now, I understand, obviously, with ITER, it's big science, and so you absolutely have to technology down select before you build the thing. But now that we're in a more agile sort of frame where there's smaller fusion, we do have a little bit more freedom about the diversity of ideas that you can put money into. I think I think that's definitely the you know the smaller technologies definitely allow there to be space for for more approaches. John, how, how and how have, you must have faced these these yeah, issues in drafting yeah. the strategy. Well, look to to provide some conflict on the panel. I thought <laughs> I thought Ian's use of massive explosions in his slide pack was completely outrageous attempt at, at scene stealing. <laughs> I'm gonna have to up my game on my PowerPoint presentations. Um now on on the I mean to boringly disagree it's a boringly agree on, on the substance of the issue. Step is a logical next step for the UK uh, and for UK AEA given our heritage and the knowledge that we built up in that area. Um, but it, it, but it is about breadth and having a breadth of expertise across all these different enabling and facilitating technologies. And if we can build a thriving sector and you get the skills and the investment that we want to build up in the UK, then you have the ability to bring forward different technologies and the ability to pivot our strategy if, if required at a later date. Very good. Now, what I'm going to do, I've not, I've not forgotten, Francesca, what I'm going to do is actually uh, invite... To, to move on to a, a kind of related question, uh, but it's come up uh, quite a bit online, and then we'll come to the audience. But and I'm going to start with Francesca, because she very briefly and delicately touched on it. Um, but some of the Q&A online have been much more explicit. First question, why isn't the UK joining Euratom? Commercially, technologically, and for global presence, it seems to make sense to do so. Um, and then uh, another a separate intervention, we're ahead in the fusion game, but a large part of that was due to our participation in your atom. Are we, are we really going to throw all of that collaboration and goodwill away in order to grow these bilateral agreements, starting from something much smaller? And is the, and then another question, is the decision to focus on spherical uh, tokamaks as distinct from the mainstream MITA effort a tacit acknowledgement that we won't be involved in ITA and Euratom. So is the model that we are now adopting partly a result of the different environments now that we are not in Euratom? And I thought, Francesca, I might start uh, with, <laughs> with you to comment on this as a, a kind of detached from some of the pain of these debates we have here. Uh, your observations on that, perhaps, that's okay. Wow, what a responsibility. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, uh, of, of course, uh, um, of course, uh, Euratom and ITER have been central in, uh, in developing technology uh, skills and uh, standards for, for the fusion industry. 
uh, for the fusion sector for for for, for years, and and I I can understand that the questions are are we going to um, to get rid of all these things or lose competition? Well, um, it's not up to me to say what sort of uh, strategy will ultimately be in place between the UK and and uh, and Euratom. Uh, hopefully, there will be something, and there are already there are still ties, of course, because. Uh, until JET was a joint European Taurus, um, data and uh, procedures were, were 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 common and were shared with the with the uh, with the Euro Europeans. Um, now uh, I think Europe is going through changes. Uh, they are understanding, and we are working a lot with them to 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 get to the point to. Uh, sort of overcome certain well, limitations in in the timeline and also in the strategy. And Europe is also fragmented at the moment. So Euratom is not not a unique thing. Uh, it's not a sort of a, a consistent uh, organization. It has various pieces and parts uh, doing different things in an uncoordinated way. So I think it's also important to understand what. Europe wants to do uh, with fusion. We made it very clear in, a, in another panel we had uh, last week in Brussels that it is, oh no, we did it, sorry, directly at the European Commission, which is launching a, um, a, a program um, that uh, Europe needs to, 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 to evolve in uh, in, in both organization and time frame and uh, and landscape so uh, i think everyone is trying to get uh, i'm sorry if, if i'm so vague but <laughs> i don't have all the answers uh, I, I think that there's still a lot of scope of working to get, for work, working together and i don't think anything is going to get lost but things need to be happening and there is a strong push from uh, from the public and also from the private sector and from governments in order to make uh, Euratom and Europe a bit more um, a bit more modern. Can I say that? Uh, Ian, what's what's your view? Oh, on this? David, um, I've had to answer this question so many times and I'm on a panel with a government person. Surely they could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, very smooth. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, it, it's fairly simple. It wasn't a kind of doctrinal decision. Um, we look very hard at what continued involvement in Euratom would look like and the pros and cons of that, and then what what separating would look like and, and how we'd take that forward. And, and we thought it was better for the UK fusion sector, better for the UK um, to develop, to go our own path. And it has enabled us to develop the kind of program we were talking about earlier, uh, which is tailored to the UK sector, which is very holistic, as Ian says. We've, we've tried to come up with something which is broad ranging and, and builds up all different parts of the sector um, and, and is targeted and, and it, it has enabled us to do that. So, so that was the driver behind it. In terms of international collaboration, you know, we, and this is where I might pass the baton back to Ian, but we are open to it's a collaboration um, and Ian can talk a bit more like that. And, and we still see international collaboration as a key part of this picture. I just add, add very briefly that um, we're very thankful, I think, to our um, European partners, particularly. So there is a big consortium called Eurofusion, which is made up of 30 different organisations. It's the single biggest grant that the European Commission give in research. And the, the UK has remained in that throughout. So we have found a way to continue participating in that programme. Our partners wanted us. We wanted to be in it. So we have found a way through that. And the same is true at ITA, actually. We have 20 people on the ground in ITA right now. We're in 30 different little projects for ITA. And I'm optimistic that we will find a way to continue to participate because it's in both parties' interests. Right. Thank you very much. And of course, and I remember even pre-Brexit, we were already thinking about the world post-ITA. It's a, you know, after that massive project, yeah. we clearly needed something nimbler. Yeah. And more effective, and it was always a yeah. plan. We would pick up the band. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kate, anything you want to add to this? I debate? guess just as a kind of a little bit of a fly in the ointment, uh, the exit for Euratom has made it slightly more challenging for academia to 
yeah. to participate in ETA because obviously the relationship is with the UK AEA and not yeah. the universities, and so we shouldn't forget where some of that expertise is sitting. Yes, yeah. and yeah. the collaborations. Right. Now, um, uh, that was a, a, a theme that came out clearly from the online Q and A. Let's now give some opportunities for people. Yes, I see several hands coming up. Let's. I, I might collect um, uh, several interventions, actually, starting there, yeah. Okay, I'm John Wood, uh, retired, but still involved a little bit. My claim to fame is I opened the first apprentice centre at Cullen. It's about a third of the size of this room, so I'm delighted to see that. <laughs> at that time, we were very interested in positioning UK industry with test facilities for structures for fusion. What has happened to that? Yeah, All right. You can take that one. Okay, we'll take that straight away. Then, yep. then we're on. So we are building actually. So te testing of structures. Um, at the moment, um, we have a facility which looks at materials properties on a very very small scale, micron scale, and we're going up to sort of centimeter meter scale. But we are building in our Yorkshire site um, a large component testing facility, which will do components which are about me, so two meters by a meter. Um, under the combined load that you have in a fusion power plant, so in a vacuum, under very high heat flux, um, and in a very strong magnetic field, so those combined loads. And that allows you to test all the brazes and the welds and the things that usually fail of big scale components. Um, nothing else like that in the world, and we're, we're building that at the moment. So again, it's you know part of our unique offering that we can say we have a test facility to test components that go into power plants that you can't test anywhere else. So, Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's connect another question over there. Yep, and we'll then move across. Yeah. Hi, Rick Parker. Uh, excuse me. Imperial College and uh, A Star Singapore, amongst other associations. Um, the physicist in me, if I go back to my roots, is very excited we've achieved thermal gain. The engineer in me thinks we're not being very honest with the intelligent public, and I think Kate touched on this quite rightly. So to get your three megajoules out from two megajoules thermal in, needed something like 300 megajoules right. of wall plug electricity. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't stop there. That 300 megajoules of wall plug electricity started off as getting on for a gigajoule of thermal energy, mm. which uh, it eventually finished up yeah. as to megajoules of thermal energy. So right. we do need to be a bit more honest there. I remember going with some fellow engineers to Cullum soon after JET had first demonstrated some positive gain. And we raised this issue with the, the people there. And they said, but the physics works. The rest is just engineering, they said. The rest is. So what I, my question to the panel is, where does your route map show us getting over that engineering hump and actually demonstrating mm -hmm. true positive energy gain as opposed to just thermal yes, gain. I think we ought to pause on that very important. And let's start with you, Ian, on that. And we'll give all four of our panelists up to you. I'm, 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 I'm minded to, to quote Walter Marshall, who I'm sure many of you know, was the chair of the Central Electricity Generating Board, who was asked about fusion in the mid 1980s. Um, and uh, his response to that was, there will come a time when we sustain fusion. Yeah, we've done that. Then there will come a time that we get more energy out than we put in. Yeah, I think we can contend we've done that. But there will never come a time that we get more money out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it's a really, really good challenge. And I quote it back to my team regularly to say, you have to focus on not just producing a thermal gain and not even just producing electrical gain, but actually having a pathway that that electrical gain is electricity that somebody wants to buy. Yeah, yeah. If you're buying electricity, if you're producing electricity and it's £2,000 a megawatt hour, nobody would ever buy it, right? So... So you absolutely have to have a pathway that gets you to elect, uh, not just an electrical gain, but commercial electricity. So the, the whole when will we have fusion, you know, our plan is that we'll build a prototype which produces net electrical gain, puts energy onto the grid, but that will not be commercially viable. Right? We can't sell that. It will need huge subsidy from the government. And only the one after that will actually start producing electricity that, that people might buy. Um, and I think it's really important to remember you know, everything in energy moves slow. All energy projects have taken a long time, decades, to take market share off the incumbents. Even when we started, you know, gas started, it took many decades to take share off coal. And everything about it's better. It's safer, it's cheaper, it's greener. You don't send people under the earth to get it. You know, everything about it's better, but it took decades to take market share off coal. So things in energy just move slowly. 
Kate, your comment on that? Yeah, so I mean, I guess it's worth saying from the inertial fusion side of things, high gain fusion, inertial fusion has been demonstrated, just secret squirrel under the ground, right? Uh -huh. So we're scaling down, not scaling up to a certain extent there uh, in a less destructive manner, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's about enabling technology as well. And we're already thinking about that stuff. You know, what pieces of the jigsaw do you need to put together in order to realize a reactor? We're, we're, we're further behind, for sure, like in our community than because we're not nucleating around, let's say we don't have a column, right? Our community in the UK don't have a column to, to nucleate around. So we're kind of, we're sort of more part of a global scene, I suppose, in, in thinking about that. We've had long-standing relationships and we had the Hyper project many years ago with, with in Europe to think about what happens if NIF demonstrates and yeah. that's coming that's back cool. up with Hyper Plus um, and things like that. So so there are sort of routes forward for a relatively modest community. Um, but as I say, again, it's, the you said the physics works, right? So physics works, that's very exciting to us. And we are have been working on advanced schemes for, a couple of decades as to how do you get to high gain in, in in ICF. So scientists around the world are thinking about that bit. It's just because of the size of our community, there's been no impetus to put loads of money in that until the NIF demonstrated ignition. Now it has, that ought to open doors, right? And and so I'm very keen to make hay while the sun shines just from a selfish point of view. <laughs> now, John, you uh, spent a significant part of your career in the treasury. So uh, hearing that expression that you might get energy, net energy out, but not money out, must have worried you. So give us your <laughs> observation. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, no one knows, right? That's, that's, the, that's the ultimate answer. As Ian said in his presentation, we have a 2040 target date and step, which pleases no one because uh, lots of politicians ask me, why can't we go faster? Lots of scientists say, isn't that audaciously quick? So if you're pleasing no one, it means, you know, maybe you're in the right ballpark. I think the key thing, the key thing at this stage is that we're focused on the biggest engineering challenges that are out there and we're prioritizing our resources. This is the treasury in me. Uh, we're prioritizing our resources effectively. And that's why uh, within the Fusion Futures envelope, we've got this 200 million for a new facility focused on tritium because we see that as one of the biggest engineering challenges that there is. Uh, so in the short term, I think it's about prioritizing those resources effectively. Uh, and Francesca, you, you know, as a commercial organization, that engineering challenge is obviously very real to you. Your, your observations? Yeah, well, thank you. Well, uh, of course, we, we've been operating for 70 years, uh, actually 71. So we've been through the transition oil to gas, uh, to, to renewables and everything else. And we know, I agree with Ian, it takes a long time for any energy system to really get to the market in a um, in a sustainable and uh, a visible way, uh, so we, we're not we're not naive on that. We know that it'll take time, and it's not just engineering. There's a lot to be done, and of course, it has to be economic, economical. It has to go to to our homes, uh, so we we need to be uh, 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 having affordable bills with, with fusion power. So whatever technology comes up. Uh, it is it's important. It could be, it, could, it can be anyone. So f for us, fusion is important as a whole. Of course, there are technologies which are a bit ahead, uh, and uh, of course we, we're pursuing the, those. Um, but um, what I what I really think is that uh, there is a potential for fusion energy to be uh, affordable and competitive with, with other sources of of uh, of energy. We've made simulations. We're, we're doing our calculations. Uh, and uh, of course, being a firm and uh, and um, a stable uh, source of power, it has the advantage of being reliable and uh, having the opportunity of working seven thousand, eight thousand hours a year uh, and complementing renewables. So the potential for uh, really cheap energy is there. Of course, it needs to go through the first of a kind of anyone, and those are not going to be cheap, and they're not going to be at the best. We know that this is why we we really need programs programs like Step because they put everyone together to to the same endeavor. Thank you very much. Let's take another question here from the front row. Yep, here comes the mic. Uh, David Kingham from Tokamak Energy. I find myself in very strong agreement with Ian and John, and and we also know Francesca very well and, and admire what she has done in fusion. 
Um, but I, I'd like to pick up on something Kate said, which is about high rep rate lasers yes. being a key enabling technology. Yes. And I think that's an important observation yes. for a country like the UK, that we should have some underlying technologies that are particularly valuable. Um, so in our case, we certainly favor the spherical tokamak. We, we have a pet spherical tokamak in our facility. Uh, we also favor high temperature superconducting magnets. And we think they are a key technology applicable widely in uh, magnetic confinement fusion. So we are keen to uh, develop that technology and we're keen to start exporting it um, you know, to, to the point of fusion industry should be capable of exporting fusion technology. We're keen to export it into non-fusion applications or plasma physics experiments and so forth. Um, and so I wanted to, um, in, in a sense, reassure John that there is some commercial return possible and the scale of it could be really quite significant. Mm. Uh, and to urge the UK to think very carefully about maximizing the potential of high temperature superconducting magnets across many applications. Well, that, that covered, that's very interesting and covered several different technologies. Kate, do you, do you want to comment on particularly, because the, the issue with, with lasers, I understand, is indeed, can you keep on operating yeah, yeah, the laser? Yeah. And also, if we're talking about commercial applications, part of the sensitivity is the dual use issue in Livermore and the fact that so much has happened to create sensitivities around the ignition model that I don't think quite apply to some of the others. So right. tell us so, what the commercial opportunities and the engineering possibilities are. So I guess it's we ought not to conflate laser technology with sensitivities around high energy density science. Those two different, you, you don't need lasers to to reach those conditions, right? So that's not a problem. It's a problem if you're working in the space, I say a problem, one has to be careful how to navigate it. You know, you've got people like Andrew at the back where sometimes I'll say, Andrew, am I touching the line here? You know, or with something, you know, you have to understand how to navigate that space where you don't cross lines if you don't have any security clearance. That's just something that is more difficult about the environment in which we operate. But that's not an issue for lasers. Like the high rep rate laser technology is what it is. It's rep lasers that can operate at high energy at high rep rate. And that stuff is also super useful for bright sources of radiation, for non-destructive testing, all of these kind of things that those, that technology would enable is just way beyond fusion. Um, and we're good at that stuff. So we really need to take note of that. And what, are, what is the commercial potential of that? Is uh, it's difficult for me to, to to comment on because I'm a mere academic, so I think I'm the wrong person to... But, like, you know, for example, if you're looking at um, bright sources for non-destructive testing, so that's could tap into airport security, for example, things like that, or, you know, uh, imaging a, a, a turbine blade operating, you know, uh, so if you use an ultra bright, ultra short source of uh, x-rays, you can see what's happening to it when it's in operation, for example. And it's sort of multimodal as well, because you don't need to go to a different machine if you want neutrons to look at that as well. You just put a different deuterated target in the way. So you can have this sort of complementary bright sources of radiation, high rep rate, high energy. Um, so yeah, there's lots of, there's lots more potential just other than fusion, basically, I would say. Ian, your observations on, on, on David's very sort of broad approach of yeah. where we have some comparative advantages. I was definitely being churlish, quoting Walter Marshall, of course, because um, absolutely I believe that as well as the long-term gain of investing in fusion for the prize at the end, there's lots of adjacencies and superconducting magnets, particularly high-temperature superconducting magnets, is definitely one of those where it has adjacencies, adjacencies into lots of other sectors where you get a return on your investment in the near term right. as well as the long term. And, and almost all of the technologies that we talk about in fusion, that's true. So we care about tritium and tritium storage and tritium breeding, but tritium is just hydrogen and it permeates like hydrogen and it cracks and, and, and swells like hydrogen. And so the technologies that we've developed for our type of tritium storage uh, equally applicable in the wider hydrogen economy and understanding how you, you put in permeation barriers to stop hydrogen 
embrittling your steel pipes and things, which are ne very necessary for the wider hydrogen economy you, you get from, from fusion. And mm. the same is true in robotics. We have to get robots into pretty unforgiving spaces and pick up very high payloads, and we need to send pipe robots down. And that has applications yeah. in all sorts yeah. of sectors, right? So there's lots and lots of spillover from investment in fusion. Francesco, as you observed, would you, would you agree with David's broad account of several different areas where we have a, a comparative advantage in the different technologies? No, absolutely, yes. And we are already, already looking into those for, for, for wind blades, for wind turbines, for uh, electric transmission over long distances, uh, also for hydrogen. I mean, um, actually, my company is the biggest hydrogen producer in Italy. Uh, for for refining and uh, and finding uh, ways of, of of getting more efficient and uh, more sustainable in that respect is important and of course the fuel cycle uh, is going to be a, an industry itself and so that that's going to build but adjacent uh, adjacent uh, um, industries are really important in order to get the path to, towards fusion commercialization, robust in the sense of having a supply chain which is stable and uh, and and uh, healthy. Right, John. Anything on it? I think it, I think it's all been said. Just just one um, very real example. Ian will correct me if I get this wrong, but I think it was uh, robotic innovation that started at UK AEA that's recently been deployed in Fukushima yeah. to, to exactly. clean that up. So that's a really yeah. good example. Yeah, indeed. Rob Buckingham, who is a an excellent entrepreneur. Now we're going to try to squeeze in their question here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're already armed with your microphone, so you've got a, te you've got a technological lead. Yeah. Uh, my question is not directly related to the speeches we have been listening. So I think I should get the chairman's permission before I ask the question. Well, I hope it's about nuclear fusion. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you don't have permission. Uh, it's, it's a rather technical question uh, because I know that from the all the fusion reactions we have considered, the deuterium and tritium fusion reaction is like the most popular one for two reasons. One is that it produces high energy neutrons, I think roughly 14 MeV. Yeah. And then the other thing is that it breeds here uh, the tritium, right, uh, using lithium. Now, and because of that is called a breeder reactor, or it's breeding tritium. But if you look at the reactions, actually what happens is for each tritium atom consumed, a nucleus consumed, you produce just one nucleus of tritium. So you, you're not really breeding. It's like a propagation reaction in chemistry, isn't it? It's rather, you can't call it a breeder reactor. I'm confused right. from that. Right. I think I'm going to ask, I'm going to have our resident academic, Kate, do you want to make any quick comments on that? Or should we take no. this discussion offline? I, I, well, it's, I don't think I'm the one to, I don't deal in tritium. Well, I think okay. Ian's more, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just a girl who fires lasers and stuff. I, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a outside quick... the reactor is here be dragons to me, frankly. So. Right. Okay. I can do a very quick answer and then we can talk outside. Yeah. But, but um, one of the, the ways that you overcome the problem that you're talking about, neutron into lithium produces one tri triton back out, is that you put some some multiplier material in there, so beryllium or lead or other things like that. Neutron into beryllium produces two neutrons, produces two tritons. So one in, two out, right? Exactly. So you get around the problem. Very good. I was about to say that myself. <laughs> um, uh, now, and finally, the, gent the gentleman there. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nick Comer. Um, if, if Lord will, it's, if you're... Uh, a lay person, and um, I, I definitely am. I only yeah. operate with, with one brain, so apologies. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm quite interested in the commercialization right. um, um, elements of this, and I, I, everything I've heard so far ha has been brilliant. It sounds like mm. we're on the right track. Uh, the reason I've come to, I, I live in North Wales, and I had a conversation with Bangor University, who tell me one of the key areas where they're trying to commercialize is elements into fusion. And I had a brilliant conversation with David, who, who was telling me this is something he's, he's into. I think post-war, this has been where the UK has been at. We've been fantastic at this innovation at this stage. Yes. My, my challenge and my question to the panel is, well, how do we maintain this? Not only from Venton and the IP, but actually turn it into an industry. 
yeah, that is a very that is an excellent note on which mm. to end. And uh, Ian, do you, do you want to engage that? Especially because you observed just a few minutes ago that even when you were getting energy out, it still have to, it would be so expensive. There'd be a very substantial subsidy required in the early stages. That's quite a resource to put in for a medium-sized economy. So, what's the potential? Yeah. So, I, I, th I think as I said earlier, I think there's two there's two lines to play here. One is the long-term gain. The energy market is just enormous, right? It sort of drives our whole economy, by the way. Where do we get the country get our debt? You know, where do we raise money from? It's usually states that have got raw materials that produce energy for the world, right? So it drives our whole capitalist economy. Um, so having a technological advantage or having a thing which you can sell in the energy market is just enormous, right? Enormous economic prize at the end of the, the, the pipeline there. So it's worth investing and being patient to invest for that price because it's so enormous. But at the same time, you're right, we're a medium-sized economy with a high debt at the moment. How do we justify that when it's a long-term payback? Well, you have to get some adjacent benefits. The Treasury ran a, an economic analysis of the investment infusion over the last decade and said for every one pound they put in, they got four back. So they're getting jam today as well as jam tomorrow. And that's really important. We develop technology, as David was alluding to, which has adjacent applications into other sectors. Thank you very much. Kate? Yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, as I say, it's uh, it was something that I raised that we might not necessarily have, you know, the big laser fusion system, although that would be really nice, please. Um, but we are certainly world leaders yeah. in the laser technology, right? So we must be really smart about that to not lose that lead and to not lose the capability to, to capitalise on that. So, yeah, yeah, I think there's space for that. Francesca, any final observation on that commercialization challenge? Well, uh, no, I agree with all the, the, the other panelists. Of course, there, there's a lot, a, a lot more to gain from uh, this uh, huge technology development. Uh, there's so much that can be used in, in other worlds. And uh, uh, obviously, we are looking into that too, but uh, with our partners as well. Uh, and the figure one pound in, four pound out, uh, I think is, is quite meaningful. It's already happening, and it will continue to happen. I think that's uh, that's a, a really good outcome. And John, you, you were the um, author, the official who's led on the strategy. Um, what are the prospects for commercialization that, that, of course, are part of the strategy? And how are the milestones so we can assess our success in doing this? So we, we published it in November, so we haven't hit any milestones. <laughs> <laughs> any milestones yet, uh, which is convenient for me at this stage. Um, so I think it's a great question, and it's one of the reasons the strategy is it, as it is, with this explicit focus, not on delivering a single project or resolving a scientific question, but building a sector in the UK with all the economic advantages that that brings. Um, so that is one part of it. And the other is, if you look at STEP again, we're not just trying to prove the technology, we're trying to prove it's commercially viable, which is which is crucial. This isn't a kind of you don't just want to solve a scientific question for the for the sake of it. You want to prove that something's commercially viable, it could be rolled out, and then the IP is enormous. But there's an awful lot of economic benefit to be had along the way, and the strategy is very much geared towards yeah. capturing them. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all our panelists. And I think that was that question, that final question was a good note to which you made. And I think Ian was really saying that even if we don't have the capacity to do everything ourselves, when you look at other general purpose technologies and how, what happens when they go global, what you want to have is some niche parts of the supply chain where you clearly are the global leader and you have the proper IP and patent protection that other countries turn to you to be the provider of that part of the total final product. And I think we've, uh, we've what we've heard today is some very encouraging examples several key bits of the technology where it does look as if the UK is a lead and we must maintain it. So I'm very grateful to our excellent panelists. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you also to our online participants. And we can now adjourn for a glass of wine next door. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>